Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the Igloo, also known as Rashid Auditorium. I asked them to turn up the heat. It's uh, quelling nausea well, but not, not boding well for our psyche. So welcome back to panel three, the future of HCI. We've looked at the past. We looked at what HCI is today. And now we're going to take an eye to the future, led by my colleague and collaborator, John Zimmerman. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, we have an awesome panel here, mostly here. Um, we'll just we'll leave a chair open for the person from Stanford who's running on California time. Uh, so we are here to talk about the future. And uh, I think the panelists' comments are going to be fairly brief because we really want to hear from what you guys have to say. And then they're here to be snarky and uh, share their wisdom. All right, so we're going to start with And really work on those interfaces. We're going to start with Chris. Could be my computer. Chris. That's me. So uh, John asked us to put together a matching set of slides, um, and starting with our background. So as like many of you, I'm sort of a lifelong tinker. It's something that I've always been doing. Um, but kind of my formative time in HCI started with a Bachelor's of Arts in Computer Science, which is a little bit more atypical. And that gave me that kind of breadth, even though it wasn't very design-centric. I got exposed to doing design classes, certainly a lot of art classes, uh, it kind of intermixed with that computer science uh, curriculum. So, you know, op running between operating systems and, like, ceramics, for example. And then after that, uh, after I finished my, my bachelor's, I went to AT&T Labs, really fortunate to have a research internship right out of uh, my undergrad. Uh, and that's where my colleagues that I'm really indebted to convinced me to go do a PhD. And so I went to CMU for my PhD, uh, you know, and spent a lot of time uh, in the various buildings that were in, in this event, uh, and then decided to stay as faculty and really happy that I did so. So John also asked us to put an, an embarrassing photo of us uh, with our time in technology. So here is high school Chris Harrison in my high school's computer lab. There's other photos that are even better to come, I will say. So they, they also asked us to put together some uh, what we thought were some notable inflection points uh, in HCI during our time here. And, and I, I kind of pulled out what I think were the most kind of, uh, I think, seminal three things, maybe four that's about to happen. So one is that even though social media predated when I joined, really is kind of post-2012, it really took off as a first-class platform. And a lot of people are consuming entirely all their, really the primary source of their content is from these social media platforms, including outlets like YouTube. And I think that's really uh, distorted how we receive, for example, like news and fake news and so on, um, and also changed the way that we engage with people. So for better or for worse, it has really altered the landscape. Second is the iPhone, I think, was a really seminal moment where we moved into the mobile age uh, properly. And then third here is I've noticed that the kind of tech industry has really entrenched and monopolized. I think, you know, back when I was uh, in uh, my undergrad, you could still do a startup company and, for example, make a new web browser or even a new mobile operating system. It's hard to remember that Android started off as a separate startup company. And now, if we, even if we had a brilliant idea for a new web browser or a mobile operating system, we would lose because you can't compete against free. And I think that's sort of a monopolistic tendency that's actually stifling uh, uh, a lot of innovation. And moreover is that if you ask startups what their big aspiration is, what's their goal, what would be an amazing outcome, it's not the IPO. Very rarely will you hear that. It's to be acquired by Google. And that's also really changed the face of computing, in my opinion, in the last decade. And then finally here, and this is really, I think, just right on the cusp, is you know, are we approaching this Sputnik moment where the U.S. is going to lose their tech supremacy? And this will have massive ramifications uh, in HCI, certainly. So, you know, what would be better? You know, what, what, how would the world be better if we could uh, kind of attack some things? Well, I would really like to see AR headsets be less goofy. Uh, I think uh, I, I have slowly become convinced that AR is actually a much more powerful paradigm than I gave it credit to a couple of years ago. But obviously, no one, is, no one in this room is wearing an AR headset. In fact, probably a minority of people are wearing even a smartwatch. But we all have smartphones. I can't tell you. Yeah, but Stanford, you know, it's ahead of us. 
Um, the other thing that I've noticed as a real st kind of stumbling block, and especially in my domain with kind of smart devices, is that there's no interoperability. You know, we all have these little silos of smartness. You know, Nest doesn't work with, you know, Philips and so on. And, and this was very kind of antithetical to of what we wanted to do with technology. When the web started, we promoted standards, you know, TCP IP, HTTP. You, it doesn't matter if you're using Chrome or Internet Explorer or Firefox, whatever. You can connect to Amazon. You can connect to that backbone. And that was a really great thing. Now the smart home is incredibly fractured, and we don't have the equivalent of sort of a universal browser, and it's really making it impossible to have this holistic smart home experience. Just really quickly, the cell phone companies in the United States are incredibly broken. Uh, it, it's much more flexible overseas. We should be able to put SIM cards into devices that just cost a couple of dollars and have them connect to like a 5G backbone or you know, at least 4G backbone. And right now we just can't do that. So you have to deploy all these kind of special Bluetooth beacons and connect it on the Wi-Fi, which is a huge pain, or just have an incredibly huge cell bill. And that's really stopping adoption of IoT. And then finally here is we really, I, I do think, and, I, and this may be counter, and this is I try to put some provocative items in here, is we need to have improved regulation for security and privacy. The fact that you know, Equifax can leak all of our credit card details and personal you know, details, and there's really no consequence and no learning that comes out of that, I think is really troublesome. If we look at like the airline industry, you know, when there's an accident, you know, the, the government steps in with the NTSB and so on to investigate that accident and promote best practices. And as a consequence of that, transportation by air is really the safest form of transportation. It really shows that regulation can work. And in actually the case where regulation has been delegated back to Boeing, we see events like the 737 MAX. And so in the security industry, there's really no consequence to having, there's almost no financial consequence even to having uh, security breaches. And there's, so no, there's no industry learning uh, to make that uh, enforced. And I think that's really problematic. Uh, John also asked us to conclude with some dystopian futures. These are just three uh, dystopian futures of men, among many that we are the you know, stewards of. So this is important for us to think about this kind of notion of runaway personalization or echo chambers as we've been calling them for many decades. But I think it's reached a tipping point in our society where we really need to deeply reflect on this. Uh, a kind of an apathy to surveillance. Uh, we think that these things have value. I mean, the smartphone is a great example. This has so much value as sort of a Swiss army knife for the digital age that we don't mind that it has microphones and cameras and sensors and fingerprint scanners. But if that was on your microwave needlessly, you would absolutely not buy that device. So it's not that we're, that surveillance and 100% security and privacy is required, um, but it has to be done in the right fashion. And right now, I think we've just become kind of lazy to defending it. And then, yeah, a much larger conversation on pri uh, profit over ethics in industry. <clears throat> I'm Roberta Klatsky, a.k.a. Bobby, better known as Bobby Bobby. So, uh, <laughs> yes, that's me as a graduate student at Stanford. Uh, so who am I? I'm a cognitive scientist who happens to work in HCI. And I call myself a researcher in perceptually supported action, which is broad enough to describe what I do. But I'm probably best known for my work in uh, touch. And I'm a founding member of HCII. I actually, uh, uh, as I think I see in the next slide, was the department head of psychology at the time HCII was formed. And it needed a lot of help, as Bonnie talked about yesterday, to basically bootstrap itself. And I think I helped in that way. You can Google me to find out more, but I have hidden secrets that won't be found on Google. I, I do have to say, I worked on the Hammer Clavier for about a... Uh, a year on the fugue, and it became creditable. But as my piano teacher said, you do a wonderful imitation of someone playing Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what was HCI like when I entered the field? I guess this is my inflection point slide. Um, first of all, as it says here, I helped create the HCI Institute by fostering it as the head of psychology. Uh, Herb Simon was in my department, and his office was just down the hall from me. And I once told him that I was his boss, and you can imagine the explosion of Simonism that came out of that one. <laughs> At the time, I think HCI was really rooted in cognitive science as it had been developed by Newell and Simon. And in fact, it's one of the things that drew me here from a cushy job in the UC system was that, in, in fact, it was so inspirational to, to enter that world that I had always revered of the cognitive science of real cognitive scientists. 
And what does that mean? Well, they had computational architecture was a major theme. Rule was developing SOAR. I think Bonnie worked on SOAR. Um, and uh, there were big concepts like the general problem solver, something that could do all rational solutions. The grain size of thought, that was one of um, Alan Newell's uh, interesting ideas. There were generalized models for the whole organism, like GOM, SOAR, EPIC, and, and eventually John Anderson's ACK. And uh, the focus of HCI was the human algorithm, and the human social context was basically sitting at a large computer. So what has changed? I think, as Chris said, the web arrived, and that's been um, mind-blowing. Uh, we started to think of the organism as being crowds or people connected by uh, a technical infrastructure rather than sitting in their own uh, one-user environment. The, uh, thought that, gee, HCI could be about helping people arose, not just uh, understanding the human algorithm and, and intervening. Uh, ubiquitous sensing, you can think of that as being bad or you can think of it as being good, and I think it has both sides to it. And of course, AI and uh, DNNs, just on the fly now, press a button. Uh, those are really big developments. But as I say here, the human has not evolved. So what are accomplishments that I could point to since I joined the field. I think educational computing, I loved um, Amy's talk this morning, cognitive tutors. We've seen that just connecting people to education doesn't work, and I might have some things to say about that. HCI for social support, smart homes, helping robots, assistive devices, again featured in the earlier talk. Support for, for work, remote work, collaborative work, uh, with transparent, one hopes, communication and interaction. Uh, big data acquisition, big data analysis, all of these are uh, uh, big changes. So what would improve us? Uh, our public education system, in my opinion, is broken. And I think HCI can help. Uh, I would love to see somehow um, us be able to detect and get rid of fake news, hate sites, um, I'd like to connect people instead of isolating them in their Twitter accounts, uh, block cyberbullying, and um, if somehow we could actually look really seriously at ethical and moral judgments and how HCI could foster them. And uh, um, yes, I love cats in boxes. <laughs> as much as I dislike playing Beethoven, I love cats in boxes. Uh, my dystopian uh, future, well, the problem is that Tech moves really fast, but human evolution moves really slow. We're kind of stuck with a thin cortex, which is a rational controlled veneer over a lot of wild stuff in the middle of the brain. Uh, so people are wonderful and wise, but they're also selfish and stupid. And I'm afraid all too often selfishness and stupidity rises to control behavior. Uh, we can't change the course of evolution, but I think that if we can understand how people are exposing their evolutionary history through their behavior, we might be able to lead them in more positive directions. And for this, and uh, I think this is really important, HCI needs to swing the pendulum a ways back from just discovering um, and making new technological insights into a theory building. And I would place out there as something to think about really hard is motivation. Psychologists stopped studying motivation when they stopped studying rats, and they lost something really important. Um, I, th I, I think that few people today probably know the PREMAT principle, which is one of the most wonderful formulations of motivation that I know of. It says anything can reinforce something that is less valuable to the organism. So anything can be both a reinforcer and a reinforced behavior. And I've heard so many people allude in the last uh, couple of days to motivation in an indirect way, including why do kids want to just make explosions rather than actually learn something from their educational device. If we could really understand the human hierarchy of motivation, I think we might have some tools that would help us build better HCI for lots of different application domains. So um, I came here 29 years ago as a graduate student, and the reason I came to CMU is I wanted to change the way people built software. 
I found it the most frustrating process as a computer scientist that I could have a vision for what it was I wanted to create. And then it took, you know, months and months of horrible hard work to get it there. And I thought there had to be a better way. Um, it was the hardest decision I ever made to come here because at that time, unlike now, when I said, Hey, I, I might go to CMU, people would say central Michigan. And, and like, unless they were computer scientists, you know, I'm coming from the West coast. Um, no one knew about it. And, you know, I had gotten into all the, you know, famous big name computer science schools and the hard decision was not to come here. It was to say no to them. But after many coin flips, I made the right decision. Um, and I came here to work with Brad Myers because I wanted to work on this vision that he had of how can we demonstrate in other ways how to create software. And, um, you know, for my PhD, I ended up building this tool where we could sketch software using a pen and leave it as a sketch, but actually try it out and run it. Now, this required this vision of, well, what will the future eventually be? Because it ran on this horrible IBM workstation and it was slow as hell. And, you know, it was written in Lisp, which I had hated as an undergraduate, but came to love with Brad, the, the things I could do just if it could be faster. It's really fast today if I rerun my software, I'm sure. And it had a Wacom tablet that you had to use. You know, there was no, like, pads, even though, you know, the first things like that were really invented in the 60s. But it took, you know, another 20 years for, like, a viable piece of hardware to come about. Now, um, as you noticed, with me getting here late, I don't take directions very well, um, including creating my slides in advance, getting here on time, going to the right building. And I almost got kicked out of this institution several times. And if you go back to the last slide, all I thought I would you know, have as proof is I got my mug. Um, and that's my picture just to go. I did have hair at one point from, that's my probably first year uh, here at CMU wearing a cow shirt, of course, because I went to Berkeley and didn't let anyone forget it because I love Berkeley. Um, my goal was to be a professor at Berkeley. And after about a year here, it was like, well, I'm going to get kicked out, first of all. Two, that's crazy. You'll never get that job. Three, look at the faculty. Does somebody really want that job? Um, <laughs> and it was only until I graduated and interviewed and then got a job at Berkeley that I actually did this somehow. Um, so... I was just taking this as what were the big breakthroughs since I graduated here. And to me, the real thing that just was starting to happen as I left, besides the web, which had already happened but kept accelerating, was really the mobile device. The, the Palm Pilot came out right around then. And though it only sold hundreds of thousands, which today we'd be like, that's nothing. It really set the stage for the device everyone's carrying. And it still took time to get there, but it was the first thing that was going to be, you know, put in your pocket and go around with you all day and use it. Um, we played around uh, when I was assistant professor with putting wireless modems on these things, with Velcro on the back, you know, so we were starting to experience what would this life be like with mobile computing. And, you know, we went through many, many different phones until the iPhone finally hit the right sweet spot to you know just cause this to go crazy um the other thing um that i think was a breakthrough was um i'm now involved in creating this institute at stanford in human-centered ai which is an effort to like get the ai people actually to do stuff in a more human-centered way um from the ground up and it's a hard problem as many of you who've tried this know but uh, when i started to look at this i tried to look at do i do ai <laughs> And I realized all the way back from my PhD onward, almost every interesting system that I had built or my grad students had built had some form of AI in it. Um, and it started to work along the way, you know, for limited problems, but it's gotten better and better. For example, I ran a research lab for Intel where we did one of the first wearable activity inference. Um, people here also from CMU had a startup here in Pittsburgh doing similar stuff. You know, that technology is what's now on your watch and in your phone. And that, that was a major breakthrough that, again, took a lot of research from a lot of places. But most people just take it for granted. They don't even think, oh, it's AI, but this is what's going on. And this stuff's continue to work. Um, when you ask me to predict what the future is, I like to look at the past. So this is actually going to be from my slides on Monday for my intro uh, HCI course to 140 students at Stanford. and 
I always have this history lecture, and it's, vi it's kind of visions of the past, visions of the future. I think we're not so great at predicting the future, but I like to, I want them to see what people had done in the past, given the state of the technology of their day. So on the left is like an ENIAC in about 1945-46. On the right, we have Vinnie Verbush, and here's an artist's conception of his Memex, which was really a personal workstation that he had this vision of, not necessarily with digital technology, but, but he had that vision when that thing on the left was a thing filling a whole room. Like the, the leap from what technology was to this vision was huge. And if you look similar at you know what Doug Engelbart's vision in the 60s was compared to what the IBM 360 mainframes looked like at the time, it's a similar leap. And I show this to students not so I could say, hey, you gotta know the history of your field. I'm, I'm now a gray beard guy. Um, it's more of, I want them to understand that the thing that I have on my wrist and that they have in their pocket and that they have on their desk if they're not paying attention to my lecture, that's not what the future needs to be at all. It could be the same leap and they're the ones, and you, the students especially, you're the ones who are going to invent this leap. And it's hard for us to know what it is. We'll go, yeah, AR, VR, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, we never know what the right one is kind of until after we've seen it. We know it's already been invented. It's just a matter of which one of these things becomes usable and mainstream enough for us to say that's the new platform. So that's how I think about it. In terms of things to watch for, you know, the things I'm worried about and things I'm working on now is that as AI works, it becomes embedded in all of our products, but it actually makes user interface design harder because you, you, you already had a hard time because we don't actually really understand people fully. Now we have this system that we, don't understand fully even worse than, um, you know, quote, deterministic software. Um, and the user's got to interact with that. And sometimes you don't understand what's going on. So whether it's from your car, I didn't know I had a build there. I had another picture. All right, the picture's gone. Okay, from your car to your cancer doctor, who knows, maybe I pulled the plug on the laptop running around out of my hotel room too fast, um, to, you know, medical diagnoses that are going to tell you whether you have a, uh, a cancer or something else. These are really serious human issues and AI is embedded in them and no one actually understands how it works and the end user doesn't understand how it works and uh, we're not going out of business as a field anytime soon because there's huge, interesting HCI and interaction problems that are going to be part of all of these systems. Hi, my name is Hai Yi. Uh, a very brief history, or, or I don't, uh, my life story. So I, <laughs> I do, no, yeah, I guess compared to all of you here, I cannot say anything about myself as a history. <laughs> anyway, so I joined HCII as a PhD student in 2009, and I graduated uh, in 2015, and then spent four years at the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor. And then I realized I really miss Pittsburgh. I want to be back, so now I came back as an assistant professor. So uh, the context when I entered uh, HCI, so um, um, starting from 2009, similar to uh, what Chris mentioned, so we have observed the shift of computing platforms. So the first iPad was released in 2010, and uh, afterwards we have been seeing that the smartphones, tablets, gradually replace desktop laptops. And nowadays we have seen that like the computing devices are embedded in everyday objects. And at the same time, uh, so at the time when I joined uh, HCI, we also observed the rise of social media and the internet-based digital platforms. Again, uh, so Wikipedia is a place that um, like I started for a long time in my own research. And in about uh, in 2007, Wikipedia become uh, for the first time become the like the top 10 most popular website. And in 2000, uh, and then Facebook announced 500 million users in 2010. And uh, Uber was also founded at that time. And um, so uh, most important advances ever since I joined uh, HCI, uh, the field of HCI, we have, uh, again, this is very similar to what we have already discussed. So we have seen the development of AI, the resurgence of interest in neural nets under the name of deep learning and question answering, 
uh, as an area become uh, very popular, and the rise of conversational systems uh, such as Siri, Alexa, and Google Home. So, um, what my view of what the next breakthrough uh, um, will be, uh, I will first say, uh, I think the use inspired AI research will probably an uh, area that will uh, draw a lot of attention, and I think we as HCI researchers should play a, a very important role in it. So this term comes from the NSF AI Research Institution call, and the definition is that we should situate the AI research in a domain of application to simultaneously inform progress in AI and also add new understanding in the particular domains. So, uh, for example, in AI, in uh, a lot of critical decision-making contexts like criminal justice, policing, clinical decision-making, and you can see that uh, in a lot of these application areas like AI uh, algorithms, machine learning, a particular machine ba learning-based prediction system have been used to inform a lot of these decision-making, but we do not know how exactly, uh, what is the best way to do that. So I think there is uh, a lot of work to do so that we can both inform the progress in AI and also that particular uh, application domains. And I think AI in learning, education, uh, is another great example of use inspired AI research. So we have already done a lot of full work in the educational tutors, and I guess that's a great example showing how we can simultaneously advanced AI technology and the advanced knowledge in domains. And another break store I think we'll, uh, uh, we might see in the next few years is to uh, how we can better develop next generation AI workforce, how we can train a skilled technical workforce. Um, so uh, in the future workplace, like AI will again will be embedded in every like workplace settings and how we can train our future workers uh, that they can like use these AI uh, technologies and how we can design better AI technologies to improve the well-beings of these workers, to improve the uh, um, efficiencies of the work. And also how to uh, educate, sorry, educate researchers at different levels and also how we can increase uh, public understanding for AI. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so unfortunately, John Kolko is not here. He chose to fly American, good choice. He got stuck in Dallas, claims it's the weather. And I'm sure if he'd been on United, things would have been fine. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but I'm going to channel John, and I'll just make stuff up that I think he would say. <laughs> uh, so John was an undergrad here. He got an undergrad degree in design and then stayed on and got a master's in HCI. He left and joined Trilogy and worked with a number of um, other grads of our program there, uh, but started doing some adjunct teaching at UT Austin. And then he left to be a professor, uh, really started interaction design at SCAD. Um, along the way, he became the editor for Interactions Magazines, sort of worked in this space between research and practice. Um, he went back to Texas and joined Frog, working in Austin. Uh, while there, he founded the Austin Center for Design, which is sort of a very unique design program. It was started in a little split-level ranch house in the suburbs of Austin, um, but has actually grown into a great school. Um, started working with my EDU as a vice president, which then got purchased by Blackboard, so then I just blamed all of my problems on John for quite a while. Um, he realized maybe he couldn't quite have the impact on UX he wanted at Blackboard and founded his uh, own studio with some partners, uh, the Modernist Studio, and that's where he's working now. And along the way, he's authored six really awesome books on the kind of design that we teach here. Um, so what was HCI like when John started? There's John. Isn't he cute? Anybody recognize that computer? It seems familiar. What is that? Is that a Lisa? Apple Lisa? Not a Lisa. They're saying no. Maybe it's a compact. I don't know. It's old. It's definitely old. Uh, maybe that's a luggable, not a laptop, but a luggable. Um, 
you like to play games, right? It's just ex exactly like Fortnite. You use a keyboard to play a game. Um, the graphics were awesome. And look, it's, uh, it's word perfect, but that's really the same as latex, like my students like to use. So things really, as far as I can tell, haven't changed since John started working. Um, what are the most important advances? This was a, he just gave this picture. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> is it Don Norman? Is that the advance? Um, is it the consideration of design? Like, I'm, I'm leaving it up to you to really think what he might be saying here. Um, I don't know if any of you have used this Philips Dark Juicer. Uh, it's awesome to use because when you put an orange on it, it eats away the chrome and it doesn't actually run down into the glass. But it's super pretty, so that's awesome. Um, things would be better if we didn't. Um, and so this is his view again. I'm, I'm left to like wonder what he's upset about. But I'm going to guess like the thing about driverless cars is they don't talk about what does the human do. So if we take over something for a human, do we actually need to pay attention to what we're giving them to do with their time and attention as we replace that task? Um, bonus points. Really not sure what he was going with here. Uh, but it's a seminar, and he's one of the speakers, and so is Richard Chinas. And Tad Hirsch was another student here. So bonus points for anybody that knows anything that this might be about. <laughs> uh, but oh, all right, there you go. HCI capstone. Hey, it's a prop. They were, you know, they wanted to get a good grade. Threatening their professors. Uh, all right, so this is now the discussion part. So you've, you've heard some, some ideas from this group, but really now we want to hear from you. Like, what are your visions of the future? And then we can critique them. I'll tell you why. It just, like, makes us very comfortable here. We're, like, professorial mode. But we really do want to hear from you. So hopefully some brave hands. All right. So you mentioned that they're uh, back in the days of Simon Newell, they're working on big theories. Um, if you could paint an alternative present with that era, what would that look like today? I'm not sure I'm clear on the concept. Paint an alternative well, present with that, with that era? Ex mean? So not, being, not knowing the history of HCI, I don't know what that means. So I'd like to, you to clarify that and maybe also sort of adapt that to how today would look like with that type of philosophy or influence? Oh, okay, I think really uh, you almost have to go back to post-World War II and the uh, advent of Shannon's information theory and the notion that the human mind, or the most useful parts of the human mind were um, describable as throughput and pipelines and memory storage systems that interacted with one another. And if you could only describe what the systems were and how much, how many things could be held in a working memory and where it got transferred to and what those rates were and, and what the span of attention was and so on, then you would be able to basically build an algorithmic structure that you would put in an input and out would pop what the human would do at the far end. So it was very deterministic and uh, successful in a very limited domain. Um, but it was very principled. We basically knew everything about the organism, so we could be predictive and we could be explanatory. So I think if we could look at that um, same lens today, of course, we're much more concerned about the non-intellectual functioning of people, the parts of them that are governed by emotion, the parts of them that are capricious and inventive and creative and playful. We're interested in what we now know are real sort of failures that if you expose if you expose the organism to educational input, for example, it doesn't just crank through and come out with understanding on the far end. So I think we would have very different notions of what the model has to cover. I mean, to be really thorough, we should also be talking about motor control, which we're trying to help people alleviate disabilities or inabilities. And so we would have, we would have 
bigger models, but it's not just about bigger. We were missing then a huge part of what I think HCI has come to study. But I think the HCI will limit itself if it doesn't go back to thinking about being predictive and explanatory and thinks that the domain of effort should be to just produce cool things to show it at Chi. I, I actually think, all right, I'll be very controversial. I think Chi has, the, the Chi conference has, to some extent, in trying to define the field, has limited the field. And um, so I'm really suggesting that we go, we swing the pendulum back enough to say, what is the organism? What is driving the phenomena that we see? And some of them are, are so very, very painful. Um, and then say, how can we intervene? But we're, we're missing that return to the understanding of the human. I had a microphone. So sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, John, I'm going to do the opposite of what you want, which is you wanted us to give you a future and you critique it. I'm going to do the opposite of that. So it seems to me that if we asked you this question, what is a future breakthrough in HCI, five years ago, you would give us the same answers. And what changed in the last five years in our visions of the future. Um, that's really controversial. I'm, I'm, I'm just pushing the panel over here, I guess. But I, I, I do wonder, because I think we talk about AI and we talk about all of these things all the time, but uh, what are we missing? Because I, I, I do feel like if we look back five years, we could have just said these are the relevant futures still. So I agree. I might have given you the same answer five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. But um, I don't think the field develops in this you know, linear fashion. There's been these big jumps, as we saw from that history. And I think many of us are waiting for the next one to finally happen, right? And it, these phases seem to go in 15 to 20 year period. So, you know, we're maybe we're close to the next one, but it's you know, that's a kind of cheating answer, but it seems to drop like that. And I'd say if we look back at the history, a lot of the things people complain about, like incompatibility of devices and platforms being controlled, all these things happen in the computer industry from the beginning over and over. You'll see the same patterns happen, and, you know, somebody comes out with a new thing that suddenly gets everyone going in a different way, and the platforms change. And I think, you know, maybe the last one was social platforms and we're waiting for the next thing. It's, it's, and like I say, this is, I think Buxton or someone else will say, it's already here. We just ha don't know which one is the one that's going to dominate. I would just add to that that I think you're right that the vision hasn't maybe changed, but I think the coefficients on a lot of those future technologies has changed. I, I think if you asked me five years ago, is fake news going to define your life for the last three and a half years? I wouldn't have said it was. I would have said, you know, democracy it works and the web is the perfect embodiment of that sort of democratic utopia. And I turned out to be totally wrong. Um, so I think, you know, we knew that kind of echo chambers and stuff were already a problem, but it, it, it elevated to the point that I think was unexpected to many of us. Um, and that's true, I think, for other domains too. And it may be true for things like augmented reality that, you know, it gets to some tipping point and all of a sudden, just overnight, everyone has a smartphone, everyone has AR. It, it's really hard to predict when the, the kind of the ingredients come together so perfectly that you have that kind of what seems to be an overnight success, but you know, in reality took many, many years. I have a microphone. Uh, so uh, I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad that you have here this different uh, vision of what has been changed since you started your work in HCI. And uh, it clearly that things that you mentioned really changed the field, like mobile devices and social platforms. But the new thing is AI, the human-centered AI. It, it's clear that it's a very new thing. It's already started to change AI. The question, do you think it's going to change HCI or just for HCI? It's nothing more than an application to AI. It's not really going to be affecting the field. Or will it? Uh, I guess, so your question is, uh, will this change HCI as a field? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it will be like simultaneously both change AI and change uh, HCI. So definitely we want to see how HCI can change AI. Like 
uh, for example, like uh, a lot of people in uh, machine learning, they have uh, they started to interest in the thing about fantasy machine learning. So they realized that oh, um, um, so the algorithms that they will inherit human biases, they will like disadvantage certain minority groups. And then these machine learning people, uh, like scholars, and I have been working with many of them, they just come up with 50 different definitions of fairness, but they never ask the questions. So it's like what people or the stakeholder really care about and what their definition of fairness is. So I guess we as HCI researchers definitely change uh, these, can, we can change how these AI researchers, machine learning researchers develop this system. But on the other hand, I think um, AI and, and like these machine learning are also changing HCI a lot. I think uh, Zhang and uh, uh, James both mentioned is like how uh, nowadays these user research, user experience designers, they are uh, they they not just facing like these unpredictable humans, but they're also facing these unpredictable like AI interfaces that uh, uh, like these adaptive interfaces or these recommendation algorithms that you, they are like a black box, not just to the user but also to the uh, interface designers. And then it, we need to come up with new methods and uh, design methods to uh, deal with this uh, increase, uh, like the, these new challenges. So I think uh, maybe you can talk about the details. Um, so I agree with all that. I think um, obviously AI is changing with people getting ideas, wanting to be more human-centered, at least some of the folks. And so we are bringing that lens of how you go about that. But that's not really changing us. That's how we always approach this problem. Um, but I think it's also different for us in that we're using this technology in a lot of things that we develop. Um, so I, I, I see it as a tool, just another tool that we're using. But I think a different thing that could happen is is our role. So I once um, served as a consultant for um, some architects who are building new academic buildings. And as a person who studied designers, I kind of was really like, they're paying me to do this. This is great. I got to watch how they ran these meetings and the architects really served as the kind of design lead bringing together all these different specialties from mechanical um, contractors, et cetera, to, to orchestrate what's going on. I think many of these systems now I'm starting to see kind of the design HCI people sitting in a role between the AI people, uh, people from um, more of the humanities and social sciences as kind of orchestrating how these things come together. So that I think that's one thing that could change in the field is kind of how our role fits together as more of like the architect for this. I'm sitting here wondering how anyone could see that things haven't changed in the last five years, but then maybe I have a different uh, idea of what change means. But I will say um, we have information and we have intelligence I'd love to think about an AM, an artificial morality, something that would actually give us a conscience when we're lacking it. That would be kind of an interesting new direction to go. This is working. I want to build on what Bobby said and go in completely the opposite direction um, and talk about, and this is where I think HCI might take us, an AI mysticism. Because AI is fundamentally about prediction, and we don't know if any of these things actually matter, but we can definitely see patterns. So is this an opportunity for people to learn which of the things that I do help my sports team win? Which, can I actually see in the data if I'm making a difference? Should I eat the hoagie or not eat the hoagie? And, and can we kind of make it playful and fun and move it actually into this wildly different space than where we sort of situate AI now? I have... Is that, is that a question? Uh, having one of the microphones. Uh, so uh, Bobby said uh, humans aren't evolving, but uh, I do think culture is evolving. So one person knew calculus 250 years ago, but now most high schoolers in the world, and most of them are in China, know calculus, uh, which goes to one of Chris's concerns, by the way. Uh, so I, I wonder about how we think about the cultural evolution, maybe that's part of the theory development in Kai we need, uh, you know, social intelligence and how that's evolving. And part of that, I think, goes to this 
like trust in AI, I, I'm thinking, do we trust our doctors? And even though we, do we understand them? Is the trust about understanding or is the trust about reputation? Maybe it should be about understanding. And it goes to like, fake news wouldn't be such a phenomena if the consumers of the news were smart enough to know the difference, right? Uh, so how do we... But we can talk about that later. Uh, so how do, we, how do we develop this social intelligence such that we can bring the AI, you know, sort of in its place so it helps us do what we want to do? I mean, my, my short reply would be, I think the scale of today's problems, it requires expertise. You know, you know whether it's like, a, you know, medicine, this isn't like go home with chicken noodle soup and you'll feel better. Like the, the complexity that we understand requires expertise. That geopolitical problems like in the Middle East is not something that you can just wing, you know? And so I, I think I think it has to be reputation driven and we want to develop deep expertise. And in many respects, there's sort of a, a culture of hostility against kind of experts and scientists, right? That's been forming over the past decade. I think it's really detrimental. I, I think you want to give people as much knowledge as they can, but they're not going to understand all the kind of, you know, metabolic processes that are happening inside the cell, right? Hi, um, thanks so much for this wonderful panel. Um, and thanks for everybody for attending. I've learned a lot this week. Um, I was really struck in the, I think it was the video last night. Um, Dan Olson, I think it was, said something that, uh, you know, the vision is, yes, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, the vision is, uh, was originally, how can we ensure that technology is our servant, not our master? And I was really struck by that sentiment because I think that's the ultimately what a lot of this discussion today has been about. Um, but it's actually the first time I've actually heard it put like that in the program here. Um, and I don't know, what, what, do you, what does the panel think about this or anybody else in the audience? Um, is this too hard a problem, you know, or are there concrete ideas that you have um, going forward, no matter what the technology is, if it's AI, if it's AR, if it's security and privacy, to ensure that these tools that we're creating and ideating aren't used against humanity. So I think that's a good question, and, and I do think it's a hard problem, but that's why I like it and why everyone here should like it. We want hard research problems. Those are the things to work on where we actually don't know the answer. That's what makes research good. Otherwise, we should just go develop the next version of whatever software that some company will pay us three times more money to do. Um, so this problem, I think, is also interesting in that we don't even know what the UI metaphors are even going to be for these type of systems. Will we have some general things that will help us understand a lot of different systems, like equivalent of getting the desktop metaphor being a thing that allowed at least a generation of people to understand computing and now seems to be unneeded for kids since they grow up with it in their hand? Um, or is it just going to be on an ad hoc basis? I, I think we don't know. And so I think the field goes from both theory and we need new theory as well as people who build stuff and try to see how it works with people and see if we can learn by trying new things out. And most of them should fail, and they do fail, but every now and then we're going to learn. And so I think this is the, one of these great problems that a PhD student sitting in the room should be like, how do I start approaching a piece of that? Because you're not going to solve it all at once um, to get forward. I also want to respond to that. I think, yes, uh, this metaphor is useful to think about. Um, but I think you should also maybe consider applying into specific problems you are addressing. So uh, it will be different about when you're talking about its design interface or, but I think it has been discussed a lot like in the past. Uh, I remember in the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, one of the intro classes that talk about direct manipulation versus the, Schneiderman. yeah, Mills, yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that, that fight, uh, all these arguments people are discussing about whether the interface should the auto, uh, should be automatically recommend things or you should like, you have direct ma manipulation on what you should do. So, 
But I think nowadays it's like AI technologies, these AI, uh, AI algorithms, should they make decisions or should they be designed to better assist the human to make decisions? So I think these are like a very long lasting debating uh, debates. But if you apply to a new like a setting, a new question, a new problems, and then uh, then you can have like uh, you can come up with more specific research questions. And that's a great thing to study, I think. Holder of microphone. Uh, I want to ask about access to information. Uh, the, the big shifts uh, were first to go from uh, information scarcity to information glut when we got the internet that provided us access to the information. Um, but early on, in the, even in the internet, uh, we still had access to the information because of curation and indexing. And then we got search. Uh, and search as we know it now is an extremely blunt instrument. Um, and it's augmented by algorithmic dispersal of um, material. Um, so search is pull and social media is push. But they're both extremely blunt instruments. Um, and they both lack uh, any analog of curation. So I have a pair of questions. Uh, one is, what can HCI do to make the current blunt instruments less blunt um, and more socially useful? And the second question is, now that we've gone from, from books to online access, to search, uh, to spew, uh, what's next that will provide us better and more useful access to information? It all depends on what useful means. Um, you know, one of the reasons that fake news is so effective is that people, I think, actually are rewarded by confirming what they already believe. And so they seek out, rather than being having their mind changed, they, they seek out sites that will confirm their beliefs. And, and so in that sense, you're pushing against that. Uh, the, the blunt instruments, I think, are actually designed to sort of keep that flow going because as, as I search in some vast <laughs> part of the Internet space, I will get more things spontaneously coming to me because of these algorithms that just relate to what I already knew. So that, that the whole system is kind of pushing us towards just self-confirmation. And so one of the tuning mechanisms that we need, well, first of all, we need a tuning mechanism for truth, which is very, very hard to do. And then we need a tuning mechanism for exploration, getting out of the rut. So sharpening the tool is that really, a, just even the goals of sharpening the tool become a complex problem. Just add one quick thought to that is, I don't think there's a way to solve it like by having Google give you better results. I think driving this from like the industry is, is impossible. I think it needs to start with better education. You know, when we teach you know, middle schoolers and high schoolers to go out and do a science project, you don't need the one chat, you know, the one paragraph in your textbook and call it quits. So I think this actually is an educational gap more than it is a tool gap. I think that's unsolvable. So it's time to train the populace to be more savvy. Uh, I want to know what what department, new department, will arise at Carnegie Mellon in the next few years. It happens every five or six years anyway, so what will it be? Maybe it should be the opposite. Maybe they should get rid of departments. <laughs> or, or, or get rid of majors. I mean, I think there's many, and because CMU is at the kind of forefront of many of those fields, I could easily see education uh, and educational technologies being the next logical one. And I can totally see, you know, things like augmented reality becoming a new thing. Like this kind of second virtual world, this digital twin is going to be this whole new landscape that's going to be pretty intriguing. Hi. Okay. Oh, okay. So I wanted to go back to um, technology being the servant and human being the master. Like, should technology be the servant? Because there's an assumption that the human is enlightened and makes the best decisions for humanity, but sometimes that might not be the case. Like, could we, should we design technology to be a check and balance in, say, the, the, the policy make, you know, in Congress or something? Or how could we design technology to be some sort of, um, over, could it override a bad decision or could it... 
enforce um, certain policies in place? I think it depends on how black box it is. I mean, it's been shown to be effective in things like unwinding gerrymandered districts, right? So, but the problem is algorithms are designed by humans and so they're biased themselves. And we've seen lots of cases of machine learning and AI being biased in just different ways. And if they're a black box, then it's even harder maybe to resolve that bias. But I think, you know, it can be an effective tool in many contexts. Well, but even so, you can see that it's been gerrymandered, but in the end, somebody still makes that district line, right? Like it's still a, the AI or the program doesn't make the decision. There are some now maps that oh. are that are adopted that are done by computer that are done with uh, census information that has no, for example, like income or race or so on or partisan bias uh, that are confirmed by computers, and, and and some states have adopted them. I think too. So I think in keeping a future focus, we should also be like radically questioning the way things work. And this actually comes from Jim. Like we vote like we live in the 1800s. So we vote where our physical mail goes as if we only had a horse to not get very far from our homes. But you could imagine living in a world where our location is tracked everywhere we go. Shouldn't you have influence based on where you spend time as opposed to where your mail, physical mail goes? Um, so. So we can look at sort of taking these small steps, but I want to sort of follow James's point of view, and particularly for the students here, can you give us a radically different future that doesn't have to deal with the problems we have now? It will create all kinds of new problems, um, but that's sort of making a much bigger leap forward. Oh, go ahead. Uh, my question is about um, I, you're talking about five years ago, the differences between now. So I was at the last one that we we were at, and I would say the theme of AI has like come to dominate a lot of the conversations I've had dramatically more so. And I think that's you know all of the advancements that Google's Google's made. Um, watching that like Google Duo, I think that's what it was called the demo of the phone call of, to the Chinese restaurant, like unbelievable stuff. Um, and I think that for me, uh, what I'd be most interested to hear is what you see for the, the MHCI students, right? The people coming out in uh, the next few years, five years from now, what does the practitioner's job look like? You know, if I'm spending most of my day working in graphics programs and doing user interviews, um, uh, what does that, what does that job start to look like five years from now? And do we need as many people, right? If a lot of that work is, seems like it's happening behind the scenes. So um, I spent the last two years consulting at Google um, in their cloud AI because I was really interested in like how are they seeing AI, but more importantly, how were designers um, in a place like Google starting to see it? And I got hooked up with some really great people there and the people in AI research repair group. Uh, I know John's given talks at some other events, they just wrote a book um, that's out on the web um, on essentially HCI and design with AI. And a lot of the things in there are the same processes and methods that we teach. You know, it's a really user-centered design, but the examples are now, you know, what's a good way to give feedback in AI? These are things that, you know, people in this room have done research on for, you know, 20 years. And so, Maybe they haven't thought big enough yet, but this is what they're looking at from seeing how they've been developing smart products internally. So I, I don't see the field having to change in a radical way as much as here's a new domain. There's some good rules of thumb, but we're still making a lot of this up as we go. Um, but it's still kind of the same kind of user-centered design. You, you do field work, you do research, you build prototypes, you test with people. The fundamentals seem the same. It's just that and these applications have certain characteristics that you got to watch out for. I think the HCI people are getting more involved with how data is collected for these systems and watch out for some of the issues that we already know about. But I, again, I don't see it as a radical shift of what students would want to know. The basics that are taught in, let's say, the master's program here, that's going to really serve somebody well, even in that new world. Yeah. 
So I, I think you're going to get a lot busier because as the tools get better, we can spend more time on the design. I mean, machine learning, like, you know, you can use TensorFlow, you can use Python, it just bootstraps it, you can move so fast. Things like Arduino have made, you know, what would have, would have required, you know, a four-year education in EE, now you can get started in an afternoon. And that's going to free people to do actually the much more intriguing things and do that kind of need find, uh, needs finding uh, that's very indicative of HCI. So I think, unfortunately for you, it's going to be a lot of 70-hour work weeks in, in five years' time. I mean, I've been interested in brain-computer interaction for a long time. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but whenever I talk to people who are, I feel like those claims of what people are going to be able to do with that stuff is still far away. We don't even understand the human brain. Um, so I think that will happen. I don't see it in the 10-year, kind of 15-year, which is as far as most of us are going to be able to reason about stuff. I see, again, things we've done in the past are happening. So multimodal. So you have these utterances and you have your gesture, your touch, your emotion. Like that, I think, is the next big design area of systems that we're going to need much better methodologies and tools, really, to explore because it's just way more complicated than if you just do single speech or gesture or whatever. And so for me, the next five to 10 years, you're going to see a lot of that before we get to brain. But when brain happens, I suspect it will be multimodal again. It won't be just, I'm going to think this stuff and, you know, the thing happens. It's going to be one more input along with other things. Similarly, as we saw the, the phone, the watch, the tablet, those other computer to, computing devices didn't go away. They just made some room for these new things. And we, the tasks that we use are more, we use more specialized devices. A similar thing will happen. These technologies, whether it's AR, VR, or brain, I don't think just wipes everything away. It, it slides into certain areas where we see it fit better, but we still use the other tools depending on what we're doing. So one of, the, one of the things that I sort of saw left out that as I looked at what's changed in the last 40 years as a, as a predictor of what might happen in the next 40, um, the most important influence of all influences on HCI has been Moore's Law. Because fundamentally, what a computer is has changed every 10 years. And so the, that C that we study in the middle just gets radically torn out and replaced every 10 years. And so the, the next question that I think about when I think beyond that is the things that don't change. So, for example, one of the things I think holding back Bobby's hope for a, a theory is our ability to understand what's going on in the brain has not changed nearly as fast as our ability to sense other things. And this disparity between levels of progress really distorts what makes it possible. So I wonder if we could, you know, if we imagine a future of what's going to get cheap and what's going to not and how will that change how we interact? Well, when we talk about the brain, uh, many people leap to studying what the brain is doing. So trying to use, for example, scalp recordings, which are, talk about blunt needles, are, are um, very, very coarse. But one could think about driving the brain in a very direct way, rather than sensing what it's doing naturally, but actually intervening and driving it. And we. We have devices, uh, we have things like the cochlear implant, for example, that do just that. They intervene at the level of sensing outside sound and delivering it to the brain and bypassing the, bypassing the ear. So uh, there are retinal implants that are trying to do the same thing for blind people. So one could think 
about why not having cognitive implants, that basically you lay down some electrodes on your brain and it, rather than sensing what you would be spontaneously thinking, it just drives your thought. And that's a little bit scary, but at least it's a new technology. <laughs> So, so I agree that um, there is this mismatch, and we, we are making progress, but it's slow there on the brain. But I also thought you were going to go with um, Moore's Law's ending, so what are we going to do on the other half? Because um, it, never it never ends. It moves. It moves. But this, this time's different, and, you know, I saw a great talk by uh, John Hennessy um, recently who won the Turing Award for his, his work in architecture and his book, with Dave Patterson, and, and really he, he showed how, yeah, we still have maybe time because they're really clever with materials and other stuff, but really this time we're really going to move to new architectures to get anywhere, and their domain-specific probably is the way to go, like you're seeing with uh, neural architectures. But there is a question, I think, for us of, let's say we can't keep relying on smaller, cheaper, faster. What do we do that's different? I think not a lot of people in HCI are looking at it. We're still assuming the same thing happens, and I don't know if that assumption will last 20 years. Uh, so uh, I wanted to actually, like, really question the role of a designer because, you, as you know, the role of a designer has really evolved from being, you know, more product-centric to kind of considering, you know, more social and humanitarian impact and I'd like to just know how you think the role of a designer has particularly evolved in the role of HCI and how a designer can, you know, provoke social change. For, for example, uh, I spoke with someone earlier about what's happening in the Bay Area of people not being able to afford living and having to pretty much live out of their cars and still, you know, being able to afford, you know, the, like uh, what, what you would expect a basic, you know, earning member of society. And due to this crisis, you know, we do not have enough designers pushing to be involved in policy. And so should we really be focusing on building new products, building new, you know, beautiful items? Or should we actually be focusing on pinpointing the actual problems we have with society, global change, harassment, all this fake news? So I just... I, as a historian, I, this is something that really concerns me because I think we need designers at the forefront pushing on these initiatives. Thank you. We, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I second. <laughs> but I also think, yes, I think we, we are. A lot of people in HCR are considering these real-world uh, problems. And uh, a lot of designers are playing an uh, important role. So uh, maybe I will just give some examples. So uh, like the Allegheny County, they are actually building uh, algorithms and to uh, prediction algorithms actually to help um, a lot of human uh, services. For example, they have been using this, um, they have deployed these systems to help uh, predict the risk score of this mal uh, child maltreatment referral course. So they're going to predict how risky each cases are and to help uh, social workers to make decisions on whether they should investigate or not. They are also uh, like uh, building, uh, they are going to build a new predictive models to help like uh, uh, providing housing, uh, deciding on the house decisions to whether to provide house to homeless people. So uh, these are uh, like, uh, they, are, they, they are trying to develop these like new uh, systems to deal with, uh, to help with a lot of like important decisions that will really impact the human lives. And we as HCI researchers get involved to uh, in, uh, improve these systems, design the system in a way that are not just the more accurate but more uh, but we're trying to see how we can like enhance the uh, people to benefit all the families and the child or children who, who are affected by these decisions to help the uh, to improve the well-beings of the people who are who, who are both uh, both people who are affected by these algorithms but also people who are going to use these algorithms to make decisions and to help the whole community so um, I think that a lot of like um, HCI methods and principles uh, will be used in developing not just the uh, algorithm, but also 
like the, um, the services, uh, like the whole like uh, organization process surrounding the algorithm. So I think uh, in uh, I guess this is just an example of how HCI people get in well really in important roles in like in like uh, trying to addressing these like real world problems. So I think your um, your point is actually timely in that you know we were asked to look back what was the field like when we started the role of the designer is really changed like before it was unless you were in a really forward thinking organization it was you know come in and fix this bad ui or the lipstick on the pig you know it was and and it wasn't a highly paid role and they never had a seat at the table in many places you know this is why you know there were exceptions like with jim and his co-founders and maya but now design is at least in the the computing world, is is finally getting a seat at the table. There's respect for design in a way there just wasn't before, and I actually think, um, kind of in the broader society, this idea of design or even, you know, to be cliche, design thinking as a problem solving methodology for other kinds of problems rather than just software. Though many of these problems are are connected is is happening so i actually think there is now becoming a way for design to kind of attack these harder problems that um, aren't purely technological You mean the schools are going to stop making kids memorize stuff and spend time on this? We're way beyond that. You sure? <laughs> no, no, actually, Maybe at some schools. Yeah, the problem is getting the organization to change is the hard part. Right. The school system. So I, I want to compliment you. That's awesome. And I actually, I would love to see this. So I've been lucky to be in HCI at a time that design has sort of risen, but I think the wave coming behind design is the humanities. And that's where questions like what is good um, are discussed in a, at a level of depth that don't take place in HCI currently, um, and that it's going to be contentious, and it's probably not that kids are good, but they're struggling with the idea of what is good. Um, and I, so I would love to see more involvement of the humanities, not necessarily um, in industry, because I don't, I don't think it's there yet, but certainly in, in the academy and in places like this, I see that as a, a targeted growth area. Just to piggyback on both of those, we've been talking a lot about dystopian futures and it's it's great to be in a domain where there's so many problems that are actually really seminal to like everyday experience and but i think it's good to also think about the positive note here which is not only do we have a lot of problems but we're also at that vanguard to make that impact that's super exciting and it's a real privilege to be in a field that has that kind of real world impact so i think we should think about ways that we can end this session on a positive note not 
lament all the problems we have, but all the opportunities uh, that the next 10 years are going to bring, and that we're the community that's going to set that agenda. So I think that I would love to hear about the kind of responsibility that you feel we have as a field to not only address those moral quandaries within our individual projects or within the kind of sc scope of the work that we do, but also in training the next set of designers and technologists. So you can see how fallout from the kind of long range effects of segmented kind of um, te uh, technological work has bubbled up in the, the walkouts um, in, at Google and things like this. There, there are now kind of debates and disagreements that are kind of bubbling up to the surface over and uh, boiling over um, NDAs and things like this. So I'm curious about um, kind of how we might infuse uh, our, uh, our kind of teaching and training um, and prepare practitioners for the world in which they w might have to call out these moral quandaries in the making, um, and what does that look like? And and it, to kind of build on that, what is as uh, researchers, um, what is our role in kind of surfacing those things um, before they take effect? Um, to say regulators, um, to piggyback on something that Chris said in the beginning. I was gonna um, say the way we often get to these new areas, um, at least as faculty, is in similar ways to how the HCI Institute started. You have to get the players in the room, get them starting to understand each other. Then they start to have things like research seminars to disseminate it more, and then eventually they create classes, and this is how the training happens. So, you know, I don't know what the situation is here at CMU. Maybe John and Chris can say more, and uh, Roberta. But, you know, at Stanford, we have a lot of the humanities and social science people are, are working directly with us and we're trying to understand, we're at that still early stage of trying to kind of understand wh where we can interact, what the interfaces are that Dan was getting at. Um, and so we're in that stage. We're starting to have seminars. We're starting to have postdocs who cross these areas and it's just getting those kind of conversations going is the first steps as you just try to get a hold of it. So we have ethicists and um, other folks like this who are jumping in and then there's a whole bunch of people in the humanities and social science who are just like scared like what's you know this is gonna take over the world and but there's a whole set of people who are really excited to have a place at the table so it actually reminds me of kind of like the early days of HCI of these fields coming together and still not really sure how we're gonna do something but it's happening which and that's exciting I guess I have raised the moral issue uh, quite, a, quite a bit, and I often do this in faculty meetings at the HCI because uh, I do think we're all so smart and we have such great technologies that if we had a better understanding of the human, then we could push, just push the, the buttons in the right way to get people to make their own right decisions, to have good social interactions, and, and, and uh, to be less, uh, to be more progressive, more selfless, and to try to ease some of the disparities that we have. So it's a great vision, and I totally agree with John's remarks that introducing uh, historians, uh, philosophers, ethicists is really, it's a wonderful thing to think about pushing the field of HCI into ever more profitable directions. So I'll stop there. I'll add just a thought, and I agree that everything that's been said, and to kind of echo some other comments is, you know, computing started, and especially kind of Silicon Valley, kind of the boom of, of computing in the United States started as a kind of a counterculture movement, and we've lost that. I think as computing has become a six-figure salary domain, we've got a lot of the, a lot of people that have been drawn into the field, for better or for worse, but certainly a lot of like bros as well. Um, that has actually, I think, made it worse. It's homogenized the field in a poor way. People are choosing computing because it's a good career and, and right on them, but not because it's necessarily a passion. 
And I think we've lost that counterculture movement where we're the crazy ones that are thinking about the next generation of technology. Certainly in this community, we still have that uh, happening. But I think if computing in the field uh, at large has changed, and I think John is absolutely right to draw back in the humanities, to bring in people that think different is something that we need to do to keep evolving and to bring back that sort of that, you know, question everything and question authority attitude that I think we've lost in computing in the last decade. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, um, that reminds, I, I agree with everything has been discussed and talk, mentioned. And also, uh, that, uh, I also remember Bob's uh, comments yesterday about how uh, we, HCII, uh, unlike the early days, we were like a startup, we already like uh, bring up a lot of different disciplines, uh, like uh, researchers, and then we really uh, having a very, uh, like, uh, really energetic, trying to like uh, uh, open up, us up. And nowadays we are like, uh, now we are really, uh, um, relatively mature, like becoming uh, like uh, bureaucratic, like organizations. So maybe like uh, at this time, maybe now with the uh, whole rising of uh, AI and a lot of like new problems and uh, in, involve ethics. Uh, or, and we, we also like... Uh, realize that we we need more like theories both like maybe that's an opportunity for us to like open again to all these discipline uh, disciplines and open to other like a part of computing and then uh, becoming like uh, trying to start up again i guess <laughs> become a startup company again. all right uh, please help me thank our panel and thank you for your awesome questions Uh, so right after lunch, there's going to be um, a madness. We're going to have eight PhD students do super short little presentations on their work. So please come back. Don't just grab food and disappear. Uh, and I'm turning it over to Jody. All right. Thank you for a morning of incredible panels. Whether or not we have every five-year anniversaries, I think we should have these panels with local people more often because they really turn up some interesting issues. So Thank you to all our panelists and moderators and those who stood in for those who are absent. All right, so this concludes HCII 25. We're now 26, so uh, we're adults. And uh, I want to thank everybody for a wonderful 25 hours of conversations, interaction. Um, it's been really great. And I especially thank our conference planning committee and all the support staff who have been tirelessly working since spring. It was amazing. You touched my heart with all that you did. So let's give them a hand. Uh, we have some lunch now in Newell Simon. Is that right? Lunch is set up in Newell Simon. Yeah. Lunch in Newell Simon. We have it for one more hour, and then we go on to the next birthday, which is RI 40th. So uh, stay tuned for more celebrations. Thank you and see you soon.